Hey, Terry B, how are you? I'm good, Mr. Chantry. How are you? Very well, very well. It's a long time no speak. I know. Thank you for having me today. It's an exclusive <laughs> It's an exclusive interview because it's your first interview from your yeah. new album, Feminine Energy, right? Feminine Energy, yes. You're my first. Oh. I'm busting my cherry on Feminine Energy I like with it. You. Wee. <laughs> so you've just released Feminine Energy yesterday, actually, in time for the election. Your passion is yeah. tangible when it comes to getting Trump out of office. You constantly take into the socials in incredible style. This is a soundtrack to the election, right? Well, thank you. Yeah, I've got a lot to say, I suppose. I, I kept quiet for the first year of his presidency. I moved to Knoxville from Los Angeles and... Um, how was that? I've got to ask you, because that was one of my questions. How was that move from the West Coast to what, as a um, geographically dyslexic person, that's right in the middle of America, <laughs> right in the middle of the States, isn't it? Right in the middle. Well, it's down south. It's down south, Tennessee. And um, if my husband, Mick, is actually from Knoxville. And I love it. It's a beautiful city and it's a beautiful state. Very different from Los Angeles, though, you know. Mm. Um, I grew up in the city. I'm, I'm definitely a city girl. We lived in an apartment there. We live in a house here. Very different. Everything's green. We have a yard. We, you know, we have a cat. We, <laughs> you know, we were out on the road before. I didn't really want to have an animal that I couldn't take care of or had to drop off with friends when I went on tour. <laughs> so I feel like now one of the reasons I moved here was so I could concentrate on writing my memoir. I mm. wanted to write a book. So I've been kind of slowly doing that as well. The Trump presidency has sort of thrown us all for a curveball i guess so this album was it was it written during the lockdown period would you say or was it was it always in the mix was it always going to happen well it was i, I actually did i recorded a song called i'm a woman for mm. international women's day um, yeah. women's equality day last year i wanted to put out something special there was a woman's march and different things going on and i thought you know what i was just so fed up with what was going on with trump and all his misogyny and everything his hatred toward women I thought I got to do something. So I put this song out with a video. So, yeah, it was sort of my F you to Trump. I decided I would start slowly writing my record. But honestly, it's been it was a really difficult process. I we started working on the music, Mick and I. Mick and I produced it. Mm. And um, we began putting the music together for the album. And I slowly started writing and taking notes and kind of getting my ideas for it together. But it wasn't really until a couple months ago that it just started pouring out of me and I think it was because the election was coming up and suddenly I it just all happened it just came in a rush and I liked that it, I waited to the end because I actually got to mention a few things and you know on the album that I probably wouldn't have had I recorded it months ago but I I just been kind of taking lots of notes and notebooks and things that I wanted to talk about and getting things situated you know, musically, and we worked really hard on it musically. The production is, we have a home studio now, so we do everything here, as opposed to L.A., where it was a bit different for us, but yeah. now everything's in-house, so it's a lot easier. But yeah, it, it sort of came over. The night before I released it, we were actually doing our final mix on American really? Carnage. Really? Putting our, <laughs> yeah, putting our final samples in, because I just, I was so, I'm I'm very much a perfectionist, mm. and I, I had these ideas of what I, I'd been collecting so many samples, and you know, every single day, this guy would say something crazier than the next, and I'm just like, my God, maybe I need to put mm. that in, mm. you know, and then at the end of the day, Mick and I just kind of sat down and said, look, we got to get this going as far as like, what's the theme going to be here for this song? And it just came together within minutes in the Mm. studio the night before I released it. It was crazy. We were out driving around Knoxville at three in the morning, listening to the record in our car on the dark roads and just playing it and blasting it. We had the roads to ourselves, and it was just such a surreal experience. That's cool. It was so great. So obviously your your last uh, hip hop album was in 2015 was called Vintage yeah. Curses. And, you know, it, right. didn't, it didn't have the rhetoric of this album. You know, it was it was it was what I would call BT, you know, before Trump, wasn't it? So Yeah. yeah. So so it was definitely a different it was more of a witchy sort yeah. of a a West Coast vibe. Well, I wrote I, the reason I did it with the sort of witch vibe on it was because it in the hip hop world I had seen so many people talking about me from the past saying, "Oh, Terry B's in like the satanic band now. She's into heavy metal. She worships the Satan. You know, she worships Satan and she's like a heavy metal chick. And I thought, oh my God, they're, this is what they think of me. It's hilarious. And I've always sort of had this witchy thing underneath. And, well, we'll come know, to the Halloween thing. thing. We'll, we'll come to the Halloween drawn thing. <laughs> yeah. And it's something I've been very drawn to and, you know, within my own life. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to, how am I going to come back? Because back in the 90s, kind of came out with this sort of gangster's mall 
female mob boss image you yeah. know, with NWA, yeah. and that was where I came from. And I thought, well, how am I going to come back? I can't really reinvigorate that. That's not who I am anymore. So um, I thought, well, I'm going to, I'm going to come out with this and I'll do a very dark album and we'll sample some things that are more on the darker side. Like we sampled Cliff Richard, Devil Woman and mm. Pentagram, mm. Forever McQueen and, you know, some things like that. So um, the Eagles, Witchy Woman, and we just made it sort of a, I mean, I'm 55. I was 50 when I pushed, I put that record out. I just turned 50 and I thought, Crazy. well, I'm going to embrace it. I'll call myself a crone. Beware the crone, you know? <laughs> this is who I am. I'm not going to lie about my age. Everybody no, knows. Well, I've got to come to that as well because I, I can't believe how well you look. You know, you look great. You know, you, you do not age. You oh, thank you. I appreciate that. But, you know, there's a lot of women in, in... I feel that in the rock world and the hip-hop world, men can always say how old they are. Mm. And they're respected. Yeah, and they're yeah, embraced. Yeah. And, they're, and no one has a problem with it. But when a woman talks about her age... It is just horrifying mm. to people. Mm. And I thought, you know what? I've never hid my age. I mean, I've had band members in the past, female band members in the early days of my room that said to me, why do you tell everybody how old you are? You shouldn't. And I'm like, because I don't give a shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is who I am. Yeah, exactly. I'm not going to lie about who I am. Exactly. And if, and if, any, with, genre, with, if any genre can get away with it, it's, it's, it's the metal genre can get away with not announcing or not, not caring about how well, old you are. I don't know. I mean, you know, it's it, it is a weird thing, though. I mean, you know, people embrace Rob Flynn and Phil Anselmo and Henry Rollins and all these people. But when it comes to women, I've had a lot of people from prominent magazines, journalists try to throw my age in my face, try to throw my hip hop oh, really? past in my face. And I'm just like, listen, I am who I am. I'm mm. not going to sit here and and talk about metal and say I hate hip hop because I'm screaming. I, I have two sides to myself. Yeah, you know, there is definitely the side of me that has the soul in heavy metal mm. and I'm a scream queen. Yeah. And then there's the other side of me where I'm a straight up rap chick. I love hip hop. And which, that which, is where I which, came from. Which goes to the question that I was going to ask, which is why did you turn to hip hop to shout the system down and not metal? I think because I just felt, I don't know, it, it was weird. We, we put our last album out for my ruin in 2013. We put out um, the sacred mood and we did our last touring off that and played shows off that. I felt very disheartened. I was just, I started growing a little bit disheartened with the whole metal community. I love to scream. I love being on stage with my band. It's, it's my baby with my husband. You know, mm. we've done nine albums now yeah. and I absolutely love it. What I don't love about the heavy metal world is all the politics behind the scenes, mm. the promoters, the record mm. labels, the, the press people, the, the type of person where I want to get shit done and I'm outspoken. And I think that I, a lot of people had issues with me because I speak my mind. We worked with people that were really sleazy. I hate to say that, but yeah. a few promoters and different people that were just not good people. Yeah. And they, you know, they did some really things and uh, it just, I, I lost heart when you, when you're working on a lot of things, I think, you know, it was easy for the guys in my band, especially my husband, you know, he does the music, he gets on stage, he plays guitar and he's, He's awesome, and everybody loves him. And we always joke like we play good cop, bad cop. I'm the bad cop, <laughs> and I have to do. I have to deal with all the other stuff. And then by the time it comes to me getting on stage, I can't. I feel like I'm so stressed out from everything else that I can't even enjoy myself. And when it got to that point, I just thought, you know what? I need a break from this. Mm. I just need a break. I need to do something that makes me happy again. And hip hop. It just makes me happy. It just, there's something about, I'm not saying I'm never going to do another metal record. I mean, mm -hmm. I did Teenage Time Killers and did a, I was part of that project with Mick. Uh, who's to say? I don't know. I can't really imagine myself at 65 screaming in a heavy metal band, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. How did you go from the first female white rapper on the West Coast to badass metal superstar? Was it like a natural progression or did you see it as like an opening for the crossover of the styles? Well, what happened was, it, it's kind of an interesting story. I, you know, I was signed to Ruthless Records and I had actually gone in and done my second rap album, Single White Female. Yeah. I'd worked with Salt from Salt Pepper. I'd, I'd worked with all these different people. We, you know, uh, Easy paid a lot of money mm. production wise to have me working with different people. I was dating somebody at the time who was in a band, a, a rock band. I went with him to a thing called Foundations Forum in Los Angeles, California. And it was this big, like, sort of meeting of record labels and different A&R people and different things. And they had bands perform at it. And Ice-T, who I knew from the rap world, 
was performing at it with his band Body Count for the first yeah. time. Yeah. I didn't even know he had a band. Mm. And I, my boyfriend's time was performing with his band, and I was still a rap chick. And I went in there, I saw Ice T with Body Count, and it blew my mind. Cool. I was like, this is insane. Oh mm. my God, this is what I need to be doing. I, I want to say so much more than what I'm saying with what I'm doing right now. I ended up going to Easy and ruthless you know jerry heller at ruthless records and saying hey i'd like to put a band together i want to scrap my album and of course <laughs> they didn't react to that very well mm. and um i had all my tapes i had all my back then we recorded everything on two inch and i had all my tapes which i took from a studio and put in storage and didn't turn in and i just sort of disconnected my phone number wow. and went quiet and went silent and um started a band i I just completely decided I need to do something new for myself, for my soul. I just felt this calling toward rock. And maybe it was because I had a boyfriend at the time that was in a rock band and I was really around that scene so much. Mm. And I wasn't feeling really happy about the rap world because of things I'd went through in the rap world and that were still lingering and behind the scenes. So I put an ad out for band members. I knew nothing about being in a band, had no clue. And everyone around me was like, what are you doing? Like, what, what, you know, this is crazy. <laughs> Suddenly want to be in a rock band. And I thought, yeah, I'm going to start a rap rock band. And I ended up meeting these guys who all were friends and they had been in bands together in the early days from Venice. And there were these like Venice dudes, like suicidal kind of guys mm. and put together this group. And I called it Manhole. I formed it. And I said, listen, guys, I'm a rapper. I'm on, <laughs> I'm signed to Easy E's label right now. I don't even know if I can get another record deal. I don't know what. Eventually it all worked out. You know, it, it's a crazy story I'm going to tell in my book about how it all went down. Mm. But, um, yeah, I, I kind of put it all together and just started playing the L.A. club circuit and building a following and really paying my dues, you know, which mm. I needed to do. So, so being in a female front of band, was it about you or was it about the band? Obviously, you had all the coverage in the magazines and the front covers and the yeah. folds like Kerrang! and Metal Hammer and those things. So was there ever a Gwen Stefani don't speak video moment in those situations? Well, it's really funny you say that. I used to fight tooth and nail with the magazines because of this, because I have always been very out, outspoken and vocal about put my band on the cover with me, put mm. my band in the interviews with me. Why are they always, especially my husband, we've had this happen for years. When we had girls in the band, they wanted to talk to the girls only and not the guy. And I'm yeah. like, the guy is the guy producing the records and making the music, mm. not the two chicks in the band. He's doing it. Or they just wanted me to be like the pinup queen. They would sit and interview me, not not to blast on Kerrang! or Metal Hammer or Rock Sound, because they've always given me press, but it was always like, we're going to give you the cover. We're going to do these big photo shoots with you, but we want to talk about who you're dating. We want to talk about your makeup, mm. your clothing. Mm. Like, mm. You, t talk shit about somebody that you don't like. Mm. It was always trying to get me to the point where I would just say something awful. And I just got to the point where I was sick of it. So I'd kind of fuck around and play, you know, we'd do shows and they'd say, you got an interview after a show. And I'd be like, oh God, I'd have a drink and just sort of talk shit. And I just got fed up with it all. And they, they wouldn't, you know, I know the Gwen Stefani thing, what happened with her, definitely a, a sink. They did to Shirley Manson. They did to a lot of women yeah. back in the day because yeah, they course. wanted the pinup girl. And in those days, you have your label telling you and your press people, like, listen, if you don't do this, you're not going to get the cover. Mm. If you don't do this, you're not mm. going to get the feature. They don't want your band. They're not interested in what the guys in your band have to say. They're yeah. interested in you. And I always found that weird, but I always found it weird that, well, why don't you ask me about my lyrics? Why don't mm. you ask me about my music? Yeah. Instead, you're asking me these really sort of fluff questions that, who cares? Mm. Now that I'm older, the age comes wisdom, and you can look back on things now I know, well, I'm not going to talk about those things. I'm Those things don't interest me. You want to talk about my lyrics? Cool. Yeah. I'm not desperate to do interviews. Mm. So I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here because I want to be. I know, that's good, that's good. So what, 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 was with the, <laughs> what was with the manhole name change to Chira Satana? I mean, that's when I started to know who you were, when I first met yeah. you at a Way Ahead record signing and then came to Rock City in Nottingham to see you play. That was, so what was with the whole transition between those two names? Well, we were out on the road and we were touring, I believe it was with Madball or Biohazard, Typo, somebody we were out with. We had a bunch of tours in a row and we were told by our record label, um, you guys are being sued for the name Manhole. 
that we had just put out. We had just done this. Yeah, we had just done this huge tour with Fear Factory and got our name out. Yeah. Then we went out with Typo for three months. I mean, we were doing tour after tour and really getting our name out there and building our reputation and stuff. And all of a sudden, our label contacts us and says, right, there's a band from Houston called Manhole. And they are going to sue you for the name. They want like $50,000 and <laughs> this whole crazy thing. And um, we're like, what? And we're in the middle of a tour. So we're like cross country. And and we don't know that they're they're trying to bring the record label to court. And I don't know what all went down. Our, our lawyer didn't handle it right. Our manager didn't handle it right. We trusted people to handle things, which we shouldn't have. And basically, we had to give up the name. Mm. instead of fight for it and it was some punk rock garage band that literally had nothing out but they heard about us and they had maybe a single out the year before like just a you know a, a little 45 or something and they decided they were going to try to sue us yeah. and it, it became this just big nightmare and so we had to change our name and we were getting ready to do a second record and it was just uh, it was just to me the momentum that really killed our momentum sure. and hurt the band yeah so yeah one of one of a really big regret in my career was not being able to fight for that name. When you moved between Tuatha and My Ruin, what was the transition with that one? Well, the transition with that one was um, that's another story I'm saving for my book, but the, <laughs> without getting give me into a full teaser, detail, give me a teaser. Um, yeah, yeah, I we were in our band and we had gotten rid of our guitar player from Manhole, who had been become a real liability. It's, uh, a liability in the band, basically. Right. And with every, we had gotten a new guy in. It was great. And we were touring the States. We were out with the Damned and different people at that time and doing great. Then our band just started, uh, another member of the band started to kind of implode a bit. This was so funny is people always say, oh, Terry B was a nightmare in the band. I wasn't actually the nightmare. <laughs> I was the one that worked really hard and tried yeah. to keep everything, keep everything yeah. together. We had issues with someone else in the band. And then our label at the time, Noise, was a, just a nightmare. And they were based in Germany and L.A. And they were just problem after problem. They couldn't get our distribution. We were out touring, working so hard. And we would get to these towns and they wouldn't have our records in the stores. Mm. And we were just like, what the hell is going on here? You know, and I would be very vocal about it. And everybody would be like, don't, you know, don't ruffle anyone's feathers. I'm like, I'm not working my ass off so that we can't sell any records. It's crazy. So, you know, I became the nightmare problem, whatever. <laughs> but, um this became sort of in the end of it all, uh, conflicts within the band. You know, we weren't seen eye to eye. We were arguing over stupid things like phone bills, like mm. dealing with like having me doing business in, in the UK and having thousands of dollars worth of phone bills and the band not wanting to reimburse me and me going, this is crazy. I'm handling all of our business. I'm now an insomniac working at four in the morning yeah. every night. <laughs> you know, like this band is like draining me. and. Yeah. I finally just said, I'm done. I'm mm -hmm. done. I started it. I'm going to finish it. And then I was offered a deal in the UK by Snapper Music to do a solo record. Mm -hmm. So that is what my ruin, initially my ruin was going to be just me working with various different musicians on different albums. I would just form different bands for that touring cycle, hire the musicians and work on it. But then I met Mick after we did Speak and Destroy. I put that out in 99 mm -hmm. and got a band together and if funny enough brought back my drummer who from manhole and Tori satana who i'd been arguing with in my previous <laughs> band and brought it back to do so hilarious he toured with me um but i met mick soon after that and we did our first record together prayer under pressure of violent anguish mm. and we ended up becoming a couple that's nice. how we kind of met and I, I met him as a guitar player and he had known someone he was working with someone that i'd worked with previously then it was just sort of history we decided to make my ruin a band yes. and take it from there and yeah it was crazy mm. but there is a side to and me we love you for that we love you for that that's what it should be yeah that's, that's it but i think that we all have a vulnerable side even the hardest most badass person out there has a vulnerable side and has a side you know it breaks my heart when i see children in cages it breaks my yeah. heart when i see things happening i know people are dying from something that could have been prevented it, there's so many mm things that are happening in our world right now that I feel like it, as I'm getting older, it's weird. I, I almost feel like I'm becoming way more emotional and empathetic toward so many things going on. When I see these, when I see what happened to George Floyd or Brianna Taylor, mm. I feel 
just sick to my stomach, but also so desperate of like, what can we do? What these Why is this happening? Mm. Why isn't anyone stopping this? Why is this allowed to happen in our country? Mm. I understand why people are protesting. I'm not down with people rioting and burning down buildings and breaking windows and looting. I'm not down with any of that. But I am down with people out there sharing their voice and standing up for what's right and speaking their minds and, you know, raising their fists in protest. Mm. And you have to. I mean, there's somebody that I greatly admire that is no longer with us, and that was John Lewis, Congressman John Lewis, and he was a freedom fighter back in the day, you know, one of the big six. And I have a song on the album called Truth Bomb, where both, you know, he died on my husband's birthday this year, a few months ago, and then followed by Ruth Bader Ginsburg, which Mm, really took the wind out of the sails for women. And I thought to myself, my God, I, I have to do something on this record to memorialize them in my own way just you know as a woman and as a white woman Mm. seeing what this man fought for and get into good trouble you know never be afraid to get into good trouble you know when i started posting online all the blogs i was writing over the last year i would get it, it became really kind of terrifying i would have these trumpers come at me and you know my husband would joke and say hey, don't open our door at night. You never know. We're living in the South. You might have somebody with a shotgun in your face. And I'm like, Jesus, you know, I mean, it was kind of crazy, but I was getting these death threats and I was getting these crazy things written to me that I couldn't believe. And it wasn't only boy people or like extreme right people. It was like from grandmas who were full on Trumpers and they had, they were just sending people toward my page and just coming at me, like threatening me. And I'm thinking, what, the, what is this world we're living in right now that this is what you're doing with your life? So did, I mean, I don't did did Knoxville yeah. see any uh, any um, any protests or anything? Was that was that yeah. across the whole of America? Yeah, we did. We had um, well, we had the first protest I went to was a women's march here when I first moved here, and I went out, I photographed it, I marched in it, and I was and I was really surprised because I thought, oh, okay, I'm going to go downtown and there's going to be like what a thousand people at the most here. There was fourteen thousand people. Wow. I couldn't believe it. I was like, my people, where are you? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I yeah. felt like I was in L.A. Huh. Then there was another. Um, they had a rally, a big event, which was the Trump impeachment removal yeah, event. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Mick came to that with me for the first time, and I photographed it, I filmed it, I was there. And then they had a Black Lives Matter rally on Juneteenth, this this past June, on June 19th. And we went down there to a big park downtown, and we thought, okay, well, at the Women's March, all these white supremacist guys from Virginia came in to the march, and so did Antifa. So we had the women all there in their, you know, gear, and their pink pussy hats and all their signs and everything. And then we had Antifa all black down with the, their whole look. And then yeah. we had the white supremacists with their swastikas and their KKK Fuck. shit on the other side. It was crazy. And yeah. the cops in the middle of it blocking everyone off. And thought, well, I can't believe this is happening. So I thought at the Black Lives Matter movement on Juneteenth, I thought, well, for sure, we're going to have a bunch of crazy white supremacists there but they didn't show up at all it was actually this beautiful moment and you had like hippies and rockers and hip-hop kids and old people and young people and i mean so many different people were out there supporting this whole thing it was beautiful Mm -hmm. and it it made me feel like i was living in la for a minute like a big melting pot so looking looking from the inside out do you do the americans see that the rest of the world are watching is that is that a conscious thing one hundred percent. I know it absolutely because I have a lot of friends in England and Europe. So yeah. I, I know they are. I mean, they write to me all the time saying mm. we're thinking of you today. Like it's it's crazy how much like especially my best friend. You know, she is so tuned into American politics, mm. not just because of me, but because of herself. And you know, she'll tell me things like I'll wake up in the morning, I have texts from her telling me, "Did you?" hear this happened or turn on this or do you know about this and she's always finding out the latest news as well over there because she's obsessed with what's happening because you know what happens in america really does affect the rest of, of the world of in a crazy way yeah, and absolutely. this is why it's so scary having such an imbecile an incompetent fool as president mm. i mean it's just it's dangerous mm. it's not just ridiculous it's dangerous to our world so <laughs> 
That's crazy. You know, I know we've got the same situation yeah, in the very, UK. You know. Yeah, we definitely know. I mean, I'm very, you know, cognizant conscious. of what's going on and conscious of that the world knows. What's day to day like in the Murphy household? It, it must be a creative buzz 24 7, right? Well, we have a home studio and yeah, exactly. downstairs. So we're all, you know, Mick is always working on some sort of music. I have my studio as well. I have a little art studio where I film stuff in and I, I'm doing photography now and I've been working on my book. So, you know, we just have a lot of different things we're always working on. But we also have a house now where we can actually work in our yard, do things that we couldn't do. I didn't know I had a green thumb. And so you know, <laughs> until I moved to Knoxville and I discovered like yard work, what is this? Yeah. I know it's crazy, but growing up in the city, those things weren't, you know, it's, it's a really great feeling to be outdoors. And that's one thing I do love about Tennessee is it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. And if we can get rid of all the crazy, uh, conservative trumpers it'd be even more beautiful yeah so how is your arm now you had a pretty horrific car accident back in 2006 you know was that a pivotal or life-changing experience absolutely yeah it was um it was very much life-changing i mean i almost died from it i almost mm. lost my arm they were going to amputate it yeah and i woke up i was really lucky there's a there's a hospital in los angeles a famous hospital called cedar sinai it's actually where easy e died i've heard of Crazy that enough. i've heard of that place yeah yeah so when i got in my car accident uh, I was a passenger in a car and a big metal rod went through my arm. I was, it almost went through my neck and I blocked it from going through my neck and slicing my throat and it sliced my arm open from yeah. the wrist all the way to the elbow. And it was the night before we were about to make our uh, record Throat Full of Heart. We were, all the guys were at the studio loading in and the next day we were going to go start recording. And I went out with a bunch of girlfriends and who took me out to dinner for a couple drinks and then we went to a gay nightclub in Santa Monica for a couple dances mm -hmm. and I just thought I got to get home and so my merch girl decided to drive me home and she had a little too much to drink and she hit a parked street cleaner and a metal rod went right through the window and the rest is history and I ended up waking up in the emergency and trauma and it was really crazy there's a there's a show called dr 90210 and it's on entertainment channel out here and it was really big back in the day and they had a lot of doctors on there that would do plastic surgery and different things in hollywood but there was one doctor a female and she did a lot of pro bono work for cedar sinai and she happened to be working on the night i was brought in on trauma this is so crazy and they were filming for the show and she happened to be in there and she told me later like um, you know, I was just about to leave and they brought you in and they were going to amputate your arm mm. and it was so bad. And she said, I said, no, I'm going to save it. And she saved me. She saved, I had five surgeries and it was really, I had a skin graft. It was crazy. I mean, they told me I wasn't going to have the use of my arm anymore. And I was in four weeks later, I was in recording throat full of heart in full bandages and it was nuts, mm. but yeah, I have a scar from it. And it was definitely a, you know, a life changing event. Mm. You go through something like that. It, it, it changes you. Definitely. Mm. So with your, you know, your Instagram, your, your, all your socials and, and you from your, all your history of everything you've done, how important is imagery for you? Because, you know, you have such strong imagery for so many years, you know, from, from me first seeing you on the cover of Kerrang, etc. How, how, how do you keep that going? Shout out to Paul Harry's. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I, I'll be really honest with you. I, I'm not a huge fan of social media. Mm. I'm just, I'm just not, you know, I think it's a necessary evil, obviously, if you're making music, especially in this, or really doing anything today, you've got to promote yourself or how else are you going to get out there? Mm. Um, back in the day, I think that I was way more outgoing as far as like doing certain things. Now I'm just sort of, I like social media. I can post on it, post a few things and interact with a few people, but I'm not that person that's going to post 10 times a week or bombard people with everything. I just, I do what I do. I am who I am. I've sort of become very comfortable in my own skin over the years. Mm. And I don't feel like I do anything anymore to like, I, I don't worry about what people think anymore. I just don't. Mm. I think I'm just at the age where I'm comfortable and I'm like, listen, if you like my music, cool. Download it free. I'm, I'm giving it away free. If you choose to donate, cool. If you don't, if, if you don't want to or you can't afford it or whatever the reason, that's okay too. I make music for me. I make it for my art mm. and it's my therapy. I don't worry about what a label's telling me to do anymore or some some idiot press person that like tells me they that I'm working with that I better do this, this and that and talk to people I don't want to talk to that I know are rude assholes that are going to write nasty things about me. But I've got to do an interview with them because they're from a certain magazine. 
yeah. F that. I don't mm-hmm. really care anymore. I want to talk to people that I enjoy talking to at this point. I don't know. It's just the world is in a different place right now. I mean, we're, we're in a global pandemic where to me, there are so many bigger things going on in this world right now. And honestly, you know, we lost our brother. Mick lost his brother in 2005. I mean, 2015. I'm sorry. Um, it happened very sudden and it was life changing as well. Like, my God, we just spoke to him and now he's gone. And Mm -hmm. like, we can all just, you really don't think about it until you lose somebody close to you that it can all be gone in a minute. Yeah, And what is the bigger picture? You know, we don't have kids, Mick and I, I don't have any sisters or brothers. I know that what I'm leaving behind, my legacy is really going to be my music. Mm. That's it. Mm. I'm really proud of what I do. So your you music. Know, so let's just, I've got a question here. This is pertinent right to this moment now. So are you known for metal or hip hop? I think I'm known for both. And I think that's okay. I think and it's I think very that okay. There are people in the hip hop hip hop world that really have no idea about what I do in metal. They they have no clue. Mm. They would never know that side of me. They don't know what Kerrang is or Metal Hammer. Would never could never even imagine me on stage with a band. Mm. And then there are people in the metal world that are like, "She was a rapper." Yeah. Easy, you know that just blows their mind when they hear it. They can't, you know. When I first came into the metal world, so many people were coming up to me like, you "Used to be signed to Easy E." This was like, I didn't really talk about it a lot because I wanted to like come in on my own merit with like I've worked for my band, I've formulated this whole thing myself. I didn't want to talk about my past. I didn't want to ride off the Easy E coattail thing. I never really did. People used to always say she's a protege. No, he didn't write my lyrics. He didn't do my music. Mm. I was my own person. And I've always been my own person. I put my own bands together. Nobody did it for me. So I've sort of always just stood for myself. I want to be known for that. I want to be known for the music I make. I think I've made some really great records. There's a couple of records in there that are a little like, hmm. You know, when I listen back years later, I'm like, "Eh." well, you know, I can't everything I don't love all the time. But the majority of the stuff that I've made, I'm really proud of. And especially the later stuff, my later stuff with my ruin, I just absolutely love and mm. wasn't on labels. We've given it away on Bandcamp. It wasn't highly promoted, but it's our best music. And Mick, my husband, is phenomenal. And he doesn't get a lot of the credit. Oh, he is. He just, He's an all rounder, isn't he? Massively. He really is. He plays drums, guitar, know, bass. He sings, he produces, he engineers. My God, I'm yeah. like, this guy is like. It's insane. And when I went to him and I first said, because when we first started dating, you know, I told him I used to be a rapper and he was just blown away by that. And I used to tell him all these crazy stories. We always joke. I say, I'll tell him these crazy stories about my life. And he'll just look at me like that can't be true. (laughs) And then later on, he'll meet somebody that will verify the story and he'll just go, it's always true. Everything you tell me is it always ends up being true. It's crazy. And you got to write a book. And, you know, I'm like, yeah, and mm. that's really what I want to do next. But um, through the years, Mick has sort of been my rock and been my musical partner. And when I came to him, and he's, I've, he loves hip hop too. And I've introduced him to a lot of the deeper cut hip hop. And he's introduced me to a lot of the metal side of stuff. Um, when I came to him saying I wanted to do a rap record in 2015, I was, I didn't really know how to approach him because he's my musical partner. I thought, yeah. I don't want to go out and like do a record with a bunch of dudes in the hip hop world that I don't really even know right now. Yeah. I want to keep this in my family. So I explained the kind of record I wanted to do. And I wanted, I wanted it to have an old school West coast sort of hip hop, feel to it and i think we really achieved that on vintage curses now on the new one same thing but we added more rock elements to it it's sort of we have some spoken word in it there's different it it's got highs and lows and different vibes and it really is who i am at the moment and i think it really speaks highly of this moment in time historically uh, dr dre situation he apologized to any female he'd hurt did did you accept that What, what was the situation there I've got to ask the question. Oh, boy. Well, I'm not... Yeah, I can't really talk... This is one of the main stories I'm going to actually talk about in my book, the whole thing as a whole, like what went down back in the day, what what happened in 2005, because when I released Finish Curses, I actually released it when Straight Outta Compton came out, Mm. the the biopic. Yeah, yeah. And then Dee Barnes, who was one of the women he attacked back in the day, who was a host of Pump It Up. You reached um, out to her, right? Well, we had never actually met before at, back in the day we knew each other you know i did her show but not when she was hosting it with another host and um so we never met but we always knew about each other and i was actually assaulted by dre at the grammy awards party 
before she was physically assaulted. Was she, that 1990, she, was it? 1990? Yeah. She, yeah. yeah my, she was really attacked. I mean, she was brutally beaten. She could have been killed. Mine wasn't to that level. But um, I had stopped working with my manager, and she had actually reached out to my manager, her mother and her, seeing if I would, like, go to court, basically speak for her on what happened to me. And I didn't know about it. My ex-manager never told me, and so I never knew. And I found out later that this she had reached out to her. But, um, you know, when Dre, to me, what, what should have happened, I think, is when, the bio, when you do a biopic, this is just my opinion, you need to come clean. You need to be real. You need to address mm. the reality of who you are and your story. And to me, I think that they really made Easy look a certain way in that movie that he wasn't. A lot of people were upset by that. I think he was portrayed in a different way than what he was. Mm. And I also believe that Dre and Cube wanted to portray themselves in a certain way that they weren't wholeheartedly through the cool. movie. Yeah, I can, and <laughs> I can see Dre why they want to do that, yeah. Right. Dre should have addressed the fact that he had a problem with women. He was very abusive to his girlfriend at the time, his label mate, myself, you know, and this host of this hip hop TV show. And there were other women as well. And if he would have addressed that in the film and actually come out and talked about it, and the, but he didn't. She wrote a thing. She wrote a piece for Gawker with this writer at the time. And then she mentioned me in it. And so a lot of people were, CNN was coming at me and Good Morning America and all these people wanted to interview me. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait. No, you know, I don't want to talk about this right now. I wasn't ready to talk about it. You know, and I'm really not ready yet at this level either. I just want to nice. kind of save it all. But I don't believe he's sorry. I don't believe he's sorry at all. And it's like, you know, he had to say what he had to say to get through the moment. Yeah. It's pretty obvious. Think... Dr Dr Dre's a misogynist. I mean, let's just be honest. Mm. Oh, okay. I can see that. I can totally see that. That's what, that's what a lot of hip-hop is. There's very, sel very few men in hip-hop that I really believe are good men. You know, Chuck D, Paris. You know, there are certain men out there that are have always stood their ground and been you know, respectful of women and had a great political message and had fought for things that were right. Dr. Ray wasn't one of those people. No. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Was there any song on the album, on the new album, that stood out to you? Nasty Woman. We love that. <laughs> we love favorite. it. We love it. Absolutely love it. And it's because <laughs> it, it drops all the big hitters in there. It's just, it's just yeah. so... It, you know, with Kamala Harris and everything is in there. That was yeah. just like so good. But what I did like, which which took me by surprise a little bit, was um, World. What's it? World. World Destruction. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know what's funny about that song is that it. For those who don't know, or those that do that are listening, World Destruction was a song done in 1984 by a group called they called themselves Time Zone, which was Africa Bambata, who is one of the architects of hip hop from right, back in okay. the 70s. Yeah, okay. And um he, he you know down with Zulu Nation and it was also done by John Lydon, Johnny Rotten from yeah, the yeah, Sex yeah, Pistols. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, So um he was you know, let himself down loved, recently. Yeah, I know. Oh god, it's not, <laughs> oh, yeah, we'll get into that. In a yeah, we'll do that. Um I didn't find that out until after I recorded the song by the way. Um <laughs> So I've always loved that song, and I've always thought to myself, God, I want to cover that one day. But it was never the right, you know, my ruin, it wasn't right for it. My other rap record, it didn't make sense. And so I happened to hear it a couple months ago, and I thought, God, that would just be great to do. So I brought it to Mick, and I said, what if we redid this? And you did it super heavy, and I changed some of the I Well, the lyrics that John Lydon says in it are today relevant. They're perfect. Mm. So they didn't need to be changed, not one word. But... The lyrics that Africa Bambata said, you know, I'm not religious, and he talked about religion. He also talked about, like, the Islamic force and different things that, like, I don't relate to. So I thought, well, I'm going I'm to sit this down and rework it and bring it into, like, what we're dealing with now with police brutality and COVID and MAGA and, like, all the things that are kind of affecting I mean, they affect us, but they really affect the world on some levels mm. and um, the overall message of it. So I changed it and I thought, who could I sing this with that would be good? And then I thought, oh, man, I used to go on. I brought this band on tour back in the day called Murder One. And one of the singers, Paul Catton, still good friends with him. I brought his bad band Barabbas out, Lazarus Blackstar. He has a new band called Dead Sharon, a new project he's doing. And we're still good friends. So I approached him and he is he is like the nowadays John Lydon over there. Yeah. Very much so. Mm. And underground sort of culty guy. 
And I brought the idea to him and he was like, absolutely, let's do it. And I sent him the track and he sent it back in a day and he had his vote. I mean, it was amazing. I was like, hell yeah. So that's probably going to be a video. Um, that's cool. But yeah, it's great. And so we had good fun doing that. And I think it's, I think the message, it kicks off the record in a, in a great way too, because I think it really sort of gets that alarm bell going of there's an alarm. This is what's happening. You know what I mean? Yeah. And now we're going to kick into the record. Yeah, of course, but of course. But Nasty Woman is definitely one of my favorites I love as well. It. And I, can you put what about that Trump sample? Oh, it's very, a, very nasty. It's hilarious. It's absolutely it couldn't be better. I mean, you mostly wrote it around that, right? <laughs> no, I well, I, I wrote it because the reason I wrote the song, I mean, obviously, he had called Hillary Clinton a nasty, yeah, but she was yeah. very nasty. Yeah, but. The reason I wrote the song, I had already recorded um, Raised Up Fist, which has got that big intro of him just brutalizing different women, saying all those disgusting, disparaging things about women. And, you know, you know we all know that he says terrible things about women. Mm. But I thought, I'm going to take this and put all these clips together and really put the impact in and make people go, holy shit, listen to this, yeah. which is when you hear it all together, the, it's so impactful. Of, this is the American president saying this this is crazy uh -huh. and then at the end he says no one has more respect for women than donald trump <laughs> and it's like you gotta be kidding me you know <laughs> you're just talking about punishing women for abortion and then you say that <laughs> so i have him like calling out reporters during it and different things um but he when kamala harris was introduced as or announced as joe biden's running mate the first thing that donald trump did was call her nasty yeah because of what she did with the hearings with brett kavanaugh Try, you know, when he was put on the Supreme mm. Court. Mm. And so he talked about how nasty she was because this is his go-to phrase with women that he's, you know, intimidated by. So there's something just clicked in me. You know, at that moment, I thought, I can't believe no one has done a song called Nasty Woman. How is this possible? And then I remembered Betty Davis, Miles Davis's ex-wife, mm. not the actress, no. Betty Davis, the awesome actress, but the funk singer. She did Nasty Gal back in the day. And I thought, okay, she did Nasty Gal. I'm going to do Nasty Woman. I'm going to bring this in and I'm going to shout out AOC and I'm going to shout out, you know, Pelosi and Maxine Waters and all the women that Trump goes after. And I'm going to do, I'm going to use his own words against him in this and kind of make it the way I made it. And it just became sort of like this little anthem that I absolutely love it. It's one of my favorite things I've ever recorded. Yeah, it's great. You know what's so crazy? When I released my record on Tuesday, I had no idea about this. It was Kamala Harris's birthday. Really? And I didn't even know it. And it was later, it was about 11 o'clock at night, and somebody wrote me and said, I can't believe you wrote or you released your birth or your record on Kamala Harris's birthday. That's so cool. And I thought, what? And the night before... She had done a rally and she was out in the rain kind of sing, or dancing at this rally in Florida. And I posted a photo of her on my Instagram in the rain with yeah, what she wrote. Yeah, I saw it. I saw and it. I didn't even know it was her birthday. And then I just thought, how weird, though, subconsciously, something drew me to that date. And I thought that was just really let's, cool. Let's hope you know? it means something. <laughs> well, let's hope so. <laughs> So let's. I'm, let's, I'm, let's, I'm hoping. I love Kamala Harris. I want her to be. I uh, want her to be the first woman president. So, that and um, you know, Elizabeth Warren. No, 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 no. AOC. Yes, yeah, yeah. She's amazing. Yeah. Amazing. She is amazing. So, what's Halloween like in the Murphy household? You know, do you, do you guys celebrate? Well, I think every day is sort of Halloween here, but um, <laughs> this year we're not. We're going. We're actually going out to vote uh, this weekend and go to a pumpkin patch because I I, I want to get a pumpkin. It's more of like every day is Halloween here sort of thing do you live in this part of our life i guess really we're yeah we don't celebrate easter we definitely celebrate halloween no, absolutely <laughs> same here so what's your favorite halloween film you know do you scare easily you can't don't disappoint me you i can't, do yeah, I, no, you know no 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 i i tell you my i have two favorite movies and one is an og movie and it's the omen one. I it's it is t timeless. You know what I mean? I mean, when I was a child, I went to see The Exorcist. My mom took me to see it. When oh, I, was I know that, that. That's me as well. That's me. Terrified. Oh, but when me. you look at The Exorcist now, it's hilarious. Mm. You can't even. It's it's laughable. But the omen is true. Like it's it's true to form of like still scary. You know what I mean? It still holds up to that timeless scare factor because it's all cerebral and it's it's very mental scary mm. um i also really like there's a there's a movie i love i can't remember what year it came out but it was called it's a black and white film it's from ages ago maybe the 50s or 60s maybe even night of the night of the hunter you ever hear of that no i don't, don't know it i don't know it but i'll check it okay. out 
it's Robert Mitchum. He plays a, a like a scary killer reverend in it, and it's he targets women. And it's just this sick, weird, um, Charles Lawton directed it. And the whole thing is filmed in this black and white, eerie, creepy. You just got to check it out. It's mm. really scary. I'm really surprised that no one's ever remade it because it's a it's a good, it holds, a, you know, stands the test of time in the scared department. So is there any creepy? I don't really is there, big into zombies and shit like that. No, no, no nor me, but is there any scary film that gets you like, nah, I can't watch that. I'm not going to watch that again. Not really. No, same. So this weekend we have Halloween followed by the big election on Tuesday. Which right. one is more scary? Well, the election, of course. <laughs> what? I so... mean, Halloween, you can cut a, you can carve a pumpkin as Trump. The election, we've got a pumpkin. We've got Trumpkin. So <laughs> it's, it's a very big difference. Yeah. So what's going to so what's what's going to happen in the election if Biden wins? Will Trump disappear? And if Trump wins, then what's next? Well, we are asking ourselves that question every day here because we've got we've got a president right now and i call this out in my song american carnage at the very end i have him saying this they a reporter asks him are you willing to accept a peaceful transition no matter what the outcome and basically if you don't win and he says in it the only way i'm going to accept it is if i win and he's threatening this right now and he's basically calling out militias I think what he's trying to do is he's trying to get these militias, these proud boys and these white supremacist mm. groups and all these different people to be on his side. We don't know what he's going to do. We don't know what he's capable of. He's going to have the White House and the power until January 20th. So Biden can win, but Trump is still going to be in there all through December, all through January up to the, tw- you know, yeah. he can make who knows what he can do, what kind of damage. And, they, you know, in, in my opinion, what they need to do is if Biden wins, then the SDNY, the Southern District of New York, needs to be ready to basically serve him and indict him for his criminality, for the things he did. The individual one stuff with Michael Cohen, the hush money payments, mm. the tax evasion stuff. There's so many different things. The emoluments. I mean, there's he knows it. This is why he's so desperate right now, because he knows that if he doesn't win, he's trying everything he can. They're going to come after him. I mean, they're writing books about this right now, you know. People like Michael Cohen, who basically know where the bodies are buried because he buried them for yeah. Trump. So <clears throat> it's he he's got to win or else. What is he going to what's going to happen? But if he does win, this is the other problem we're dealing with. What is going to happen to our country? So what's going to happen to the world? From a, from an Englishman's point of view, could he ever mm-hmm. go to prison? Absolutely, and not as president. He can't. No, no, not as president, no. but afterwards. He has to be out. That is the thing. And the other thing is, he ha- They have to be ready, in my opinion to go to indict him like he's not going to do a peaceful handover to biden you're not no. going to see what happened with obama handing no. the you know keys to the white house basically to them and and shaking their hands and inviting them in that's not going to happen with the bidens mm. this has gone too crazy so you know it is he's not going to be at the inauguration he's going to call it all fake he's going to say it was all rigged he ha- biden has to win right now by such an overwhelming amount yeah. that it is undisputable and right now people are coming out in droves vote, voting mm. i mean if all the people in this country would come out and vote that never voted before all the young people that the mexicans the mm. the women the uh black people like people that don't necessarily haven't voted i'm so pissed off about the kanye west thing because the republicans backed him with that to get yeah. him on the ballot because in their eyes, that's going to take away from Biden mm. the the black vote that if they don't want Trump and they don't want the other white man, they'll vote for the black guy, mm. which is ridiculous. Mm. Who the hell would vote for Kanye West? But they'll people do think like that. Like, I'm not going to vote for the old white guy. And and I get that. But you it's can't. a dead vote, isn't it? Ridiculous. It's a dead vote. It's just ridiculous. Yeah, yeah it's ridiculous. So is, is, is Trump a, a true Christian? Absolutely not. I mean, <laughs> would you think that in any way? He doesn't even. Yeah, I. I mean, I've seen interviews with this guy. Listen, I'm not religious, but I know the Bible. I know a few religious books. And you ask him. I, you see these evangelicals or different people ask him, recite your favorite passage from the Bible. He's like, I like them all. When someone says I like them all, it's like saying to him, What's your favorite song on the new record? I like it all. Mm. You didn't listen to it, did you? Yeah, you didn't yeah, read it. Cool. You know, it's like he can't even recite anything. It's all just he's an authentic fake. So what do you think to rappers such as Ice Cube, 50 Cent and Kanye telling their fans to vote Trump? Well, I don't think that 
Ice Cube is actually telling his fans to vote Trump. Um, I think 50 Cent may be, and I think that Kanye now wants people to vote for him. So, you mm. know, he went from Trump, 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 looking like a sucker to that. I don't, Ice Cube is a great rapper, and I'm a fan of his rap, fan of his music, and uh, I've always been. But, I mean, what he pulled recently was absolutely the stupidest stunt he could have pulled. Really naive. I, I mean, I tweeted him, and I, I, I wrote, Trump is Jerry Heller on steroids. I mean, you thought Jerry Heller was terrible from Ruthless. This guy's him on steroids, literally, from the COVID. But it's just, to me, I look at people like that, and I think, well, they're only concerned about their money. These guys mm. are making millions. They're trying to pretend like they care about like people living in the ghetto and the conditions mm. of this and that. Listen, you're a millionaire in your million-dollar mansion. You don't care about these people. What you care about is protecting your effing money. People like Paris and Chuck D, those are the people that care about people. Mm. Those are the people that are coming out, putting stuff back into their communities. And those are the people that are actually coming out with a new record, with a message. What Ice Cube was singing Arrest the President last year. This year he's saying, let me get in bed with the president? I don't think so. I don't think so. Mm. So to me, I mean, I'm a white girl rapper. My record is coming out saying saying what Ice Cube should be saying on some songs. You know what I mean? Mm. To me. Yeah, absolutely. It's a disappointment. It's disheartening to see that. It's really disappointing. I would like people that, I mean, I'd like to say the people that know me from the metal world, my bands, and from Manhole, Tura Satana, My Ruin, even if you're not a fan of hip hop, give this a little listen. There might be something on it for... For you to enjoy it's a, a but, but socially what? conscious it's brilliant thank you i really appreciate it it's it's a very weird thing for me because you know i i do know that i am way more known in the rock world and people are approaching me with rock stuff right now and i'm like but i'm doing a hip-hop record so we have to talk about that because that's what this is so it, it is a course. weird thing for me but i love that you approached me and i i've enjoyed myself talking to you it's been great like I said, this was a great way to sort of bust my cherry for the new record. And so to put it, I appreciate it. I appreciate you taking the time to speak with me. Terry B, okay. thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Thank you for having me. 